today we're going to conclude our series, Ecclesia. What does it mean to be a part of the beautiful bride of Christ? So let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll dive into God's word. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we give you glory and honor. And today, as we dive into your word, would you just use all that we've already experienced this morning to draw us and focus our attention on you and what does it mean to truly be a part of the bride of Christ? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. I forgot to mention, they will be at the Next Step stations afterwards. They have some CDs back there. I would love for you to patronize them. And we need to connect him and Brinson to do a collaboration or something. Do we not? Come on. That would be amazing. So, so honoring moms today, that's got to be part of what we do, uh, certainly, isn't it? Uh, moms have one of the, if not the most difficult job on the planet. Yes, if they raised you, they have one of the most difficult jobs on the planet. Um, to you single moms, a special shout out to you. I remember what it was like growing up in the household of a single mom. I remember like Ruth's Chris was actually chicken pot pies from the microwave on a Friday night. Come on, Jesus. Anybody grow up on Stouffer's chicken pot pies in this house? That's what it's like living in that kind of a single mom family. Whatever it takes. And we appreciate you and we love you and we're here for you. Just know that if there's anything we could do for you, do not hesitate one bit to reach out to this family. Uh, that's what we're here for. We are a faith family. We are part of the bride of Christ and we love all of the moms in this place. A special prayer goes out to you moms who are here today who may have lost a child. We absolutely love you guys and we know that pain. We know and share in that with you and we commend you. For those of you who have maybe lost a husband as well who are widowed here, know that Journey Church is here for you. And I even pray for you husbands who maybe recently lost a wife as well. I know how hard that is. Just know that part of being a, uh, the bride of Christ means that we care for one another and that we're there for one another. And I know this day is filled at times with mixed emotions, some beautiful, some, you know, very difficult at times. So I even get a shout out to all of you perfect moms who do absolutely nothing wrong. First and foremost, you're liars if you're falling into that category. You're okay. You're allowed to make a mistake or two growing up. Your kids will somehow make it through it. I don't know how they do it, but you will one day see them grow and thrive and become all that God wants them to be. And to you moms who maybe blew it, know that God covers all things, that he loves you and cares for you. If you will repent, if you will seek him out, God has a way of restoring those things that seem even unredeemable. Can I get an amen to that? So let's use these analogies of the princess bride, of the bride. What, is, what does that mean? I think every young lady, for the most part, one of the dreams that's aspired to is that you would be that princess, that you would be that bride come your wedding day. Some of it is reality, and some of it is generally mixed with a dose of Hollywood, right? Um, it can ruin it if you're all for that Hollywood wedding. It might not be just that perfect, but God has a way of working it out no matter what. And each and every wedding, no matter what way, shape, or form it takes place, is absolutely beautiful if Christ is first in your relationship from the beginning. I've had the great joy, I guess it was over five years ago, of giving away Miranda and uh, Pat's here today. We love you guys, and it was just a great honor and a great joy to give them away. And when I think about that, it, it is one of the most difficult things a dad has to do. And we're going to draw an analogy back to that in Scripture in just a little while. But it's a tough thing. You do everything that you can to raise your children in the Lord and try to point them towards success and then one day you've got to hand them over to this other guy that you barely know at that particular point, right? I thank God for youth group. Both of our girls have met their significant others in youth group, so get your kids to Brinson's youth group. Come on, Jesus. You want to see them grow up and do that? And, um, you know, um, Molly is not married yet, but we're speaking prophetically that there's this guy named Tyler Miller that one day maybe prophetically maybe will happen. I don't know. I don't want to put any pressure on him. He's not here today. He's working He's a SWAT guy, so he might kill me when he finds out, um, but it's all okay. You know, he was so cute. We, we get the great joy of that. So today he, I'm in trouble. Yeah, so um, Tyler comes over. Uh, I'm bad at keeping secrets first and foremost, so don't tell me any secrets. It'll go all downhill from there. But Tyler comes over, I guess it was like Thursday, and we were watching the dog. If, if you saw, I'm digressing, but if you saw the, we were dog sitting on 
on uh, Thursday and her dog like is half terrorist and it tore up my entire office like from end to end. And the reason that it was really there was so that Tyler could sneak over and get the dog's footprint and paint and make a card to mom. So Molly got her first Mother's Day card because she's watching her first dog. So she comes out and then and he even calls this morning. So he's a great guy. He calls this morning and he calls Mary Jo, don't forget to go give her the present. So they make me go grab the dog this morning and we tie this little bow around his neck with the little thing. I'm like, dude, you need to put a ring on it. Why am I still doing all this for you right now? What's wrong with that? It's time, it's time already. But <laughs> now I'm really in trouble. Uh, so he, he runs in, with, the dog runs in with the card and it was all oohs and ahs and filming and it was just beautiful. But those are the joys of, you know, you know what the greatest joy of being a mom or dad is? When your kids actually grow up and you get to be a grandparent because that means you survived the previous time and... Uh, Great joy in that. So I seriously digress. Let's get back to God's word here. Come on, Jesus. But uh, I say all that to say that, you know, last week we maybe dealt with some of the challenges of what it means to be a part of a faith family, a part of the bride of Christ. Today, let's talk mostly about the benefits. What does it mean to be a part of God's family? What does it mean to be a part of a family? I think there's a lot of analogies, both in the natural that we can draw from Scripture today and in the spiritual. We're going to try to meld both of those worlds together and just speak really of the benefits of being a member of God's family. I want to use a little bit of uh, some of the stuff that I'm sharing today actually comes from what I share during most of the weddings that I do. There's some scriptures that I share, some things that I share. We're going to draw those together in that commitment of what it means to be a part of God's family. And every wedding that I perform, um, you kind of go along these lines. There's a part where you exchange the vows, right? I, Eric, take thee, Mary Jo, to be my lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness or in health, to love and to cherish until death do us part, according to God's holy ordinance. Maybe in the same way that we wed a loved one, we come before us. Every Christian, there's a day where you stand before God and you say, Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that I might have life. You forgive me and I'm saved by the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. And from this day forward, I will live for you, for richer or for poorer, in sickness or in health. I will surrender all to you and I'm going to live for you from this day forward. You see the analogies between the two, right? There's there's this wedding that takes place when we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ just as we do in the natural. There's one exception to the statement that I just read when it comes to our Christianity. In that statement I said, until death do us part. In Christianity, death is just the beginning. It's when we go on to be with him in eternity in heaven forevermore. I debated what I was going to preach this week, and I was really drawn to Ephesians chapter 5. I couldn't shake it off. It's one of the things that I do share during weddings. You'll know this set of verses well, Ephesians 5, 22. It says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so wives should be submitting everything in everything to their husbands, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that we might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. For he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are all members of his body. Therefore man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let his wife see that she respects her husband." So God is drawing these very strong analogies between his relationship with the church, with the bride, which is you and I, and this marital covenant with one another. He's giving us some instructions in the natural that are worth remembering and worth reminding ourselves of. Ladies, we are to submit to our husbands as our husbands submit to the Lord. Submit is not a bad word when it comes to a healthy Christian home. Can I get an amen, right? 
It's not a bad word. So it's nothing that we should fear. Maybe in our society they want to make us fear it. In our sinfulness, maybe we should fear it. Um, because if we try to wield our manliness in an unhealthy fashion, that is not what this word is telling us about right here, is it? He's saying that Christ died for the church, and in so doing, the same way husbands, we need this mutual submission, this complementarian relationship between us and our wives, where we too submit to them, where we submit to each other actually in mutual submission, even as we submit first to Christ Jesus as the head and Lord over our marriage, right? That's what makes for a healthy marriage. So guys, guys, put this into practice. Ladies, put this into practice. We want the marriages here at Journey Church to thrive. We want to not just see them survive. We don't want to see them just get by. We want to see them thrive. That's one of the main things that we love to see happen here at Journey Church. I just love the words there where it said, Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Think about that for a moment. Internalize that for a moment. It's really for you. Christ gave himself for you. If it was just you, he still would have done it. He loves you just that much. God loves you that much that he would send his one and only begotten son from heaven to earth to show you the way, to be there for you, to die in your place for your sins that you might have life. He loves you just that much. It says there in scripture that it is Christ who is sanctifying us. Don't resist that sanctification process. Allow God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to be at work in you, to transform you. Don't be hard-headed when he's trying to change you, when he's trying to transform you into the person that he wants you to be. Don't resist the power of the Holy Spirit. It says that we are cleansed by the washing of the water with the word. Now, some of you who don't live in the country may not get this all that much. Anybody live in the country and actually live on well water? Anybody in here live on well water? Only like three of you? Come on, Jesus, y'all city dwellers. Well, we used to live in a master plan community for the majority of our life. And I took water pressure for granted. I took the fact that you can actually like turn on the shower and you have water pressure and it doesn't smell like sulfur. I mean, I took this for granted. But in the country, it is not so, people. I mean, you take a bath out there and it still thinks like you need to go get another bath. First and foremost, the water pressure is not all that good. It smells a little bit like sulfur. And you get out and you're like, oh man, I gotta go take another bath. There's something wrong with this. So now whenever Mary Jo and I get to go to the hotel, I'll be like turning on the water for like an hour. I'll be staying up there in the shower like, thank you Jesus for water pressure. Thank you so much for hot water and water pressure. You walk out and you actually feel clean when you get out of there. So it's an amazing thing. We take water for granted, do we not? Something that they don't do so much in Israel, right? There's no one hour showers in Israel. We do have clean water, yes. I mean, like, she's, she's worried that, like, we live in the... We, we, apparently, we have clean water. I don't know. You can smell us later. I don't know. It's all good. Yes. Molly's, <laughs> Molly's pet. How am I going to continue after that? What are you doing to me? But it is peaceful and comforting to know that you are washed in his word, that we're part of his bride. And it says there that Christ presents the church to himself. You know, the analogy I really get in the midst of that is that I talked about earlier, like a husband or a dad that's going to present their daughter to the new husband that's going to take over that relationship. There's something humbling in that. You know, you're walking down that aisle and you know that you're giving them away. And that's the impression that God's trying to give us there is that he loves us just that much, but he's giving us to himself, to his one and only begotten son. We are part of the bride of Christ and there's just something beautiful in the midst of that. So God calls us to partner with a church. As believers, he calls each and every one of us who are followers of Jesus Christ to be plugged into church, to be a part of his bride, a part of the ecclesia, 
to make um, to do the hard work of making his bride beautiful, to brag about it to our friends, to love his bride even with all its flaws, even with all its challenges. God calls us to be a part of a community of believers where we can be all in. If Journey Church isn't that place, I encourage you to continue to search and search and search until you find it. When God calls you to that place that you can say, I'm all in, I'm home. This is the place that he's called me to. And when you get there, go all in because some of the verses that I'm about to share can only really take place in that context of Christian community. Ephesians 5.1 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. He calls us to be imitators of him. You know, I read that verse when I was preparing my message and I couldn't get any further. Right now I'm holding myself together in that, but being a son of a single mom who knew that I was rejected by my father, never having met him, never having understood the love of what a father was really about, to read something like this that says that Christ loved us, that I am a beloved child, that he gave himself up for me as a fragrant offering and sacrifice unto God. Oh my goodness. How amazing is that? Somebody loves me that much? Somebody loves me that much? My, my fair service to that is to be an imitator of him, to go out there and tell the world about him, to share the good news about the fact that he loves me. How, how else can I contain myself when somebody loves me that much? Many of us in America, we do come from broken homes. You could relate to what I'm saying. You didn't understand the love of a mother or a father, but God loves you just that much and wants to teach you what love is really all about. He loves you just that much. What kind of love is this? See, in turn, we can be fathers to the fatherless and mothers to the motherless. That's what a faith family can do when we rally together around one another. We can be there for one another to lift one another up in our times of need, to care for one another, to just be there in the midst of those difficult moments of life. That's one of the benefits of being a member of the family of God. We can imitate Christ. I hope Journey Church is known for doing just that. Let us continue with every ounce of energy within us to pour out his love on the lost and hurting community that surrounds us outside these walls, but also inside these walls because there's plenty of pain and hurt right here within Journey Church that God is mending on a daily basis. And any Christian church that's going after it with Jesus is going to be just a little bit messy because we all have issues, right? Even people with crowns on their head. Come on, Jesus. We all have issues. Let me get to the meat of my message, and then we'll, we'll, we'll close it off. Membership puts us in a place where we could love, learn, serve, grow, warn, and live on mission. I think they, might, they don't have that one up there, but let me read it again. Membership puts us in a place where we could love, learn, serve, grow, warn, and live on mission. Ephesians 4, 1 through 11 he starts to tell us about our roles within the body, how we can grow together, what our jobs are. He says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers with a particular job to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we can attain the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of sound doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head unto Christ, for whom the whole body joined and held together with every joint which is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love it builds itself up in love so this set of verses begins to give us some insight into what Christian life is about and why we should be a part of a family so let's go back to our natural family for just a moment we just did some baby dedications right so we brought some babies up there to be dedicated in the Lord. What are they doing? 
um, in, in, in modern day Christianity and evangelical circles, we don't, you know, baptize babies. We dedicate babies because we believe here that to be baptized, you must believe and be baptized, right? So there's nothing wrong with it if somebody was baptized as a baby. There's nothing wrong with it. But we believe that to truly be baptized, you need to make a confession of the faith and understand what sin is all about. Then you, you confess your sins. You go under the waters of baptism. Then you come out in newness of life. So we dedicate babies unto the Lord. It's not really so much for the baby as it is for the parents. Why? They're saying, I want to raise my child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I want to raise them up with everything that was within me. I want to see them prosper. I want to see them succeed. I'm going to align my life with the Lord's, and I'm going to teach them and train them up. In the spirit of Deuteronomy chapter 6 that we talked about last week, I'm going to raise them up with everything within me so that they could be all that they could be in Christ Jesus with the hope that one day when it comes, say, in American culture past high school, that they could leave the house and be successful on their own, that we've taught them the things that they need to do to be mature in the natural right really we're seeing the same analogy here he's saying that there's different jobs that people have within the church it says that there's apostles and preachers and teachers and these offices of ministry and their sole role as leaders in God's church is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry we can't do all the ministry. It just can't happen. In fact, God never created it to be that way. There's never supposed to be some professional class, class of clergy. It's meant to be that every Christian uses their heart, skills, and abilities and challenges one another and loves one another and warns one another and serves one another and all the things that I said in that sentence. Why do we do all these things? So that we might present each other mature when we go on to leave this place, right? See, someday all of you are going to leave this place. One day this place, Journey Church, will not exist, right? Some of you are here for a short time. Maybe the Navy brought you through the doors today. Maybe you're stationed here for three years. Our hope is that when you get here and you're part of the Navy, that when you leave here, you're more mature, you're more fired up for Jesus, you're more excited to live for him, that no matter how long we have together as a faith family, that we love one another enough to grow with one another and help each other to go on into maturity wherever we might find ourselves. Is this all making sense? So that's what he's saying there in that scripture, that we need each other. There's this body dynamic. In fact, he goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 12, 4, he talks more about these gifts. There are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. There's a variety of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. What he's saying there is that we all have gifts to use and you're supposed to use them. 100% of Christians are supposed to be engaged. Why? Because he's given us these gifts, it said, for the common good, to make life better for those around us, inside the walls of the church and outside the walls of the church. He's uniquely equipped and gifted you to reach people that only you're going to reach. If you go on in scripture, it also talks about the fact that every one of us does have a gift and that if you withhold that gift, if you do not use that gift, then the body suffers. The common good is decreased. We were never created to be on the sidelines until you go on to be with in heaven. We'll read the final verse in just a moment where one day you and I are going to become a part of the great cloud of witnesses. We're going to be watching from up there in heaven. We're going to be observing what the next generation that comes beyond us is doing. We're going to be cheering them on and saying, go for it, go for it, go for it. But while you're here, you're supposed to be players on the field. So get in the game if you're not. I can't encourage you enough to get in the game. Serve. Go all in for Jesus Christ. Can I get one more amen? amen. Why do we do all these things? There's just a couple more verses. 1 Corinthians 12:6. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, we rejoice together. Now you are the body of Jesus Christ and individually members of it. He goes on to conclude this set of verses in verse 31. And he says, and still I will show you a more excellent way. One that we read at a lot of the weddings we do as well. You all know this verse very well. Love is patient. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. God's love empowers his church. 
We are the church. We are his people. So how's that lived out in everyday life, in church body life? How's it expressed? Let me give you a few examples of how we do this amongst the ecclesia. Sickness, right? Somebody gets sick inside of the body. What do we do? We rally around them. We're there for them. We take care of them. We visit them in the hospital. We take food to them so that they don't have to cook and worry about those things. Maybe the same vein, someone passes away, right? We're there for their family. We show them how much we love them. See, what scares me is the opposite of these things that I'm talking about. When people don't get connected, when they're not plugged in, when they're not in a small group, when they're not serving, then what happens is you call the church office and you're like, I need help. And you're like, we barely even know you because you've been staying on the fringes of Christianity and that's not where God wants you to be. See, I've never seen a person who's all in serving or all in in a small group come to me and even need me to come minister to them or show up in the hospital because their small group's already doing it. Their serve team's already doing it. They're engaged, they're plugged in and the people around them naturally care for them and are there for them in the midst of those difficult moments of life. But also, what about the joyful moments? About babies being born and being dedicated unto the Lord. How awesome is that, right? We get to share in the joy with people as they have new babies. Or weddings, right? Those are awesome too. Who doesn't like going to a wedding? We get to go enjoy those moments as well. But maybe even situations like benevolence, where you find yourself momentarily on a little bit of hard times. See, we pool our resources together to help one another even when it comes to those difficult moments financially. These are benefits of being a part of God's body. Can I get one final amen to that? See, Christians are not supposed to be a people who sit on the sidelines. As members of God's family, we're drafted as citizens of his kingdom, and God calls each of you to be giants in the faith. All of you are powerful. All of you are mighty. All of you are equipped to make a difference. My final verse for today to conclude our series, Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. God is the head of the church. We are members of that body. We are part of the beautiful bride of Christ. He gives each one of us a job to do. He gives each one of us a race to run. And there's people in heaven already cheering us on, trying to